from today's gospel. Then one of them, when he saw that he was healed, turned back, praising God with a loud voice. He prostrated himself at Jesus' feet. He thanked him. In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. This is one of those gospel readings in which I like to remind us that every time we see in one of the Gospels a story of healing, it is not just about a physical cure. It's a moment that Jesus uses to teach us about the ways of God's reign, the ways of salvation itself. And there is a distinction always between being cured and being made whole. The word for healing in Greek, which is the language the Gospels are written in, is the same word as salvation. Healing and salvation have the same word in Greek, and both mean in Greek the idea of being made whole, perhaps being made our fullest selves, is another way of thinking it, or maybe even restored to the way God intended us from the very beginning. And we see that distinction between being cured and being healed in today's passage. We also see something else in this passage that ties in with the start of our stewardship season. In August, we heard a verse from the 12th chapter of Luke where Jesus said to the crowds gathered, where your treasure is, there your heart will also be. And that inspired this year's stewardship reflections of what is our treasure and where is our heart in relationship to that treasure and how does that shape our lives. And believe it or not, none of this is about money. Because that's something that falls into place after we get everything else taken care of first. Understanding whose we are. Understanding what our treasure is. And where our heart is. What it means to be made whole. And how we live into that reality. This passage to me is fascinating. Because it's set up in a very specific way that Jesus' hearers would really notice. Ten people with leprosy come to Jesus to seek healing. Ten is a significant number in Judaism. And in this particular instance, these are ten men. It takes ten men to make a minion. M-I-N-Y-A-N, not the other kind of minion. <laughs> ten men to make a minion, which is an assembly or a synagogue. And so these people with leprosy come together to form a synagogue and are healed by Jesus. But one of the men isn't Jewish. He's a Samaritan. And remember that Jesus' ministry is always a ministry of welcome and inclusion. And there's something about bringing in this outsider this person who's even kind of despised because he's an outsider who lives on the margins and who really doesn't do things the way we do it, doesn't see things the way we do, and whatnot, who's now welcomed and brought into the center and is essential to this group becoming an assembly. A rabbi once wrote that you can have nine of the most educated, most devout Jewish men in the world, and because they are only nine, they cannot read the Torah aloud and debate its meanings. They need that tenth. And the rabbi wrote to talk about the importance of a single Jewish person. Because that person could be the most uneducated, uninformed, backsliding kind of person of faith ever. But still would be that tenth person that suddenly breaks everything wide open that makes this community whole. In this encounter with Jesus, that person is an outsider, a Samaritan. 
That's something in itself worthy of reflecting. But what I want to think about is why those nine men walked away to go to the priest, as Jesus said, and they did exactly what Jesus said, that's fine. But the tenth man turned around and said, oh, wait, praise God, thank you. Why did that tenth man do that? Why did the other nine walk away? What does that have to do with where is our treasure? Here's something about treasure that I've discovered in my own life. You can become so used to your treasure that you no longer see it as treasure. It can become so ordinary that you can begin to take it for granted and just assume it's always there. Even worse, I can become to feel entitled to that treasure. And because it's become so ordinary and so mundane, I can think, you know, there's better treasure out there. And so I'll, I'll save my, my praise and thanksgiving for the really good treasure, because, you know, this treasure is now just part of my daily life. But the outsider, this was new to him. It meant something. And so he saw that it was indeed treasure. And the first thing he did was to offer praise and then to bow and worship and give thanks. And that teaches us something about prayer. That the foundation of all prayer is first of all praise and thanksgiving. What were the first words we sang coming in here? Father, we praise thee now the night is over. We're not even going to get into our petitions and requests of fix this broken world, help me get through this day, heal me, forgive me my sins, until later in the service. The first thing we do is praise God. And the whole nature of this service is thanksgiving. That's what the word Holy Eucharist means, to give thanks. And what do we do with the altar? Lift up your hearts to the Lord. It is, lift up your hearts. It's right to lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give God thanks and praise. And then everything else flows from that. So thanksgiving and praise offering are a response to recognizing treasure. But I think it's also a way into helping to rediscover and reclaim our treasure when we've forgotten I was at a retreat once at Holy Cross Monastery, which is an Episcopal monastery on the banks of the Hudson River across the river from Poughkeepsie. Gorgeous setting. In fact, that whole region is called Monastery Row because every faith group in the world discovered this is a beautiful place to plant a religious community. And so you've got the Catholics, you've got the Orthodox, even there's a Buddhist community up there as well. And so Holy Cross Monastery, which has been there for 140 years now, offers this hospitality to any who want to spend a weekend in prayer and retreat reflection. And Brother Bede, one of the monks who'd been there for quite a while and was known for his spiritual depth and wisdom, was, was giving a talk. And he talked about how he's lived in this monastery for 20 years at that point. And at least four times a day, he makes a round trip from his room to the monastery chapel walking along hallways with windows that look out at the gorgeous Hudson River, seeing the leaves change in the fall, the leaves bloom in the spring and whatnot. And he said one day he was caught up short and realized he, didn't, he hadn't seen that for weeks because he was thinking about his name, thinking about his tasks, thinking about this, thinking about that, thinking about brother so-and-so who was getting under his skin and all this other kind of stuff. You know, monks are human too. And... It was a guest who came up to him at a coffee break just to marvel at how beautiful the landscape was, and how God was surely present in all this beauty, and how it just lifted her heart to God to see all of this. And that caught up Brother Bede short. And he said, I realized I hadn't noticed that beauty for a long time. And it took a stranger to remind me of what was right in front of my and so he offered an extra act of praise and thanksgiving in the chapel for that treasure that was right there as a part of his daily life.
In the stewardship season, we're asked to reflect on what our treasure is. We have many treasures. We have family, we have friends. God willing, we have jobs we love, and if not the job itself, at least the vocation that we exercise through our job. We have a community. We have opportunity. We have so many things. But behind all of that is the one who is the creator of all things. And sometimes I think that's the greatest treasure that's the easiest to forget. And one of the blessings of being a part of a religious community is that weekly we get that reminder of who is at the center of our lives and makes everything else possible. And even more, we get a reminder not just where our treasure is, but what is God's treasure. Because that passage that says, where your treasure is, there your heart shall also be, comes at the end of a whole teaching, which clarifies just how much we are valued in God's eyes. And that we are the centerpiece of God's love. God made us in God's own image. How can God not love us? And the cross above my head, with arms stretched wide, is an example of the depths to which God will go for God's treasure. Over the next few weeks, I'm not asking people to think about money. I'm asking people to think about where is your treasure? Where is your heart? What blessings do you have in your lives? And I'm going through this exercise as well that may have become so ordinary and routine that we no longer see them. How can we rediscover them and offer them thanks to God for them? And how can we use these gifts that God has given us, use these treasures in service for sharing of God's love, of God's grace, of God's peace, of God's boldness? If we explore those questions, everything else falls into place. And even in our own lives, when we face struggle and doubts and fears, frustrations and anger, even, taking a moment to offer praise, to offer thanks for what is, can reorient the heart and guide us through. A retreat I was on this last May, at the end of the retreat when we summed up everything, every person gave a witness of what they took from that retreat, and the whole community said together, for all that has been, we say thanks. For all that will be, we say thanks. It's amazing how that can lift the heart and carry us on. May God guide us to discover our treasures, to delight in them, and to turn our hearts towards them with such joy that we could share them with this world. This is our custom and our stewardship season we have members of the congregation share their story, their witness. And I would like to ask Candy Cooper to talk about her treasure and her heart.